Okay, so I'm going this in this lecture we're going to discuss the repercussions of Martin Luther challenging the church and the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and its effects on the rest of Europe. So to recap, as I usually will do um, for what we talked about in the last lecture, the church does not allow for dissent, the Roman Catholic Church. And we saw that there were reformers even back as early as the 14th century or attempted to break away. Um, and essentially the church has been able to, up to this point, overall maintain control of uh, religious doctrine within the empire. Now Martin Luther, as a Catholic monk himself, a German Catholic monk, he makes a case for what he has issues with within the church. And this is considered intolerable. He's condemned as a heretic, but he stands his ground. Although what happens for Luther is he ends up uh, getting support from other nobles who are wanting to question the authority of the uh, so-called Holy Roman Emperor. Um, and so... Martin Luther creates a split between the nobles. In a sense, this is where the uh, Europe starts to crack and divide into different um, sets of loyalties. Now, Martin Luther was really conservative. He was not a man of the masses. So you know, he may have set off in motion this idea of, of uh, rebelling against church authority. But he had a lot of support among uh, uh, from other rulers who wanted a chance to break away from the authority of the church and the Holy Roman Emperor. So when there were peasant revolts or other kinds of revolts, he urged German nobles to smash, strangle, and stab. In other words, he certainly w was not a supporter of massive resistance to um, authority. While... Other dissident priests that were uh, emerging did, such as uh, Zwingli, he did seem to uh, uh, give at least some lip service to the idea of revolt. And, and this is essentially what's happening. Martin Luther merely set out to say what issues he had with the church. That's it. And what's happening is now there's, you know, cats out of the bag. Every, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on now. And, and uh, you know, with, with Martin Luther, whether you would agree or disagree with some of the issues he had, one could argue that he really believed uh, in the faith that um, he claimed. While other reactions to the church may have been on less nobler uh, grounds, or some would maybe view it that way. I mean, so as it was, by, uh, excuse me, 15... 29, people who followed Martin Luther were called Protestants because they were protesting. And so that again, like I mentioned, the idea of being a protester against the church started happening on different fronts. King Henry VIII uh, was considered a defender of the Catholic faith, and what happened for, for him was not some sort of revelation from God about changing the ways. But he simply wanted to divorce his wife, and divorce in the Catholic Church still to this day is not accepted. So what does he do? He says, well, I'll just break away from the Catholic Church, I'll become the supreme head of the Church of England, and then I can get my divorces. And so that's how the Church of England forms. So that's one form of, uh, you know, pro protest against the Church. Now we go to John Calvin. And uh, I don't want to say he's the most serious of, of the ones we've been talking about, but he he's very intense. I mean, if, if there's a doubt about the actual spiritual motives of King Henry in England, John Calvin certainly had a serious commitment and passion to his ideas about theology. He was very focused on the scripture. He wanted to pretty much break away from everything that looked Catholic. Keep in mind that Martin Luther 
still like he kept a lot of practices that were a part of church tradition that weren't necessarily strictly a part of the Bible. The Bible that only up until around this time is starting to become solidified with some sort of consensus, by the way. And uh, if you want to ask me any questions about that, please send me a text. I don't have time to go into it uh, all that much. But um, he's definitely more of a textual-based as opposed to tradition-based uh, theologian. He looks in the New Testament and he says, and he focuses on this idea of predestination, that God is all-powerful, and so essentially... All of us are born into heaven or to hell, and there's nothing we can do about it. And there is the elect that God's already chosen, and that's life. And the best you can do is pray, follow all of God's teachings, and your actions may show that you are actually a part of that. Um, but that's kind of a, a certain essence of uh, one of the major aspects of Calvinism. He develops his own set of followers and sets up in Geneva, Switzerland. And I put on here puritanical. I, I don't want to try to editorialize this or, um, you know, again, I'm always trying to be careful because theology, I'm teaching this as history, but for, for many uh, of my students, some of you actually embrace the ideas of one of these branches. And so I, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to look down or show favoritism on any of the ideas. But one could say, if we're going to be fair in terms of looking at what was happening with John Calvin compared to something today is a lot like the Taliban or the way that uh, Islam operates in Saudi Arabia. He wanted a very austere society that based their, everything on religion and did not allow for a lot of worldly things no, nor uh, uh, other ideologies. So he may have... You know, his followers may be perse persecuted by the church, but he wasn't calling for religious tolerance. He was calling for religion to be done right his way. Okay, so he had religious police going around uh, checking out behavior, anybody getting drunk or, or doing any sorts of, you know, bad things, whatever bad uh, was to be determined by him. Uh, even a man uh, here, as I have in this illustration, was burned at the stake for heresy so it seems that all the religious reformers or most of them were all equally not tolerant okay they simply had different views about religion john knox is a was a follower of john calvin and he sets to his homeland scotland and create uh, sets in motion presbyterianism um i myself as a child was baptized into the Presbyterian Church, um, and um, you know my family uh, you know, broke away from that. Like all Americans, we always keep doing things our own way, I guess. But again, many of these ideas, many of these uh, church I'm talking about, Lutheranism, Catholicism, Presbyterianism, all here with us today, all um, evolving in different ways. But the way we handle them in America now, the, the, this religious variety is different than Europe was handling it back then. So in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about the way that all this, the different opinions about religion is starting to affect uh, Europe in a very uh, tragic way at this point in history.